Thank you very much indeed, Mridula, and, and dear colleagues, thank you very much for coming. Thank you especially to those colleagues who have written uh, to express support, and thanks to those of you who've um, taken up Kevin's invitation and uh, contributed to the Ukraine crisis appeal. It's a, a time uh, of great, great catastrophe in Ukraine, and all of your assistance is most welcome. My talk today is titled The Ukraine Crisis, Where Are We Now and How Did We Get Here? with some reflections on the issues the crisis raises for the engaged researcher. Now, I'd like to start just with a review of the situation today, the 16th of March, 2020, uh, 20 days 21 days into the war. And uh, I cannot help but begin with some words of general judgment of what is happening. Um, we are looking at an invasion. We're looking at Russia's fundamental breach of international law. We're looking at an outrage against common humanity. We're looking at an invasion that was unprovoked. Uh, an invasion where Russia is the clear aggressor and Ukraine is defending itself against foreign aggression. I feel the need to say these things because sometimes people find other words, euphemisms, uh, in which to say the same thing. We refer to this as the Russian-Ukrainian conflict, as though there were two parties in some way equally responsible for this, uh, or the the unfolding tragedy, uh, or other formulations which sidestep <coughs> the issue of condemnation of the guilty party, uh, which is more difficult than expressions of empathy for the victim. So, the summary. Militarily speaking, there are four fronts on the north, east, and south of Ukraine, and also around the capital, Kyiv. Um, <clears throat> the Russian invasion force is now more or less fully within Ukraine, and it has been experiencing relative success in the south, where a few middle-sized cities have been taken. Elsewhere, it has not been particularly successful. None of Ukraine's ten largest cities uh, have been taken, although some of them are encircled. Um, <clears throat> the blitzkrieg that was planned uh, has failed, and so uh, the stage of bombardment of selected cities is, is taking place. Uh, what's the humanitarian situation? Well, there is now quite deliberate shelling and bombing of civilian infrastructure, residential buildings, and residential districts. In uh, some places, like the city of Mariupol, uh, which now lacks water, electricity, heat, and communication, uh, the situation is one of disaster. Uh, Kharkiv, the second city of Ukraine has been bombarded so fiercely that 600 residential buildings have been destroyed, but it uh, is still not controlled by Russia. Uh, we witness a failure by Russian forces to respect negotiated humanitarian corridors. We witness massive displacement of internal refugees into western Ukraine, and of those, uh, three million approximately have now crossed the border into neighboring countries, the greatest number into Poland. Those uh, moving abroad are almost entirely women and children, uh, men aged between 18 and 60 uh, must remain in Ukraine. And I can note that there has been no major protest or no major efforts to avoid that uh, regulation that requires men to stay and fight. The international situation is, I think, fairly 
transparent at this stage. Uh, the NATO countries and their allies, including Japan and Australia, are now giving Ukraine uh, lethal defensive aid, uh, weapons, um, serious weapons, but there is no agreement to enforce a no-fly zone over Ukraine or to provide fighter planes because it's felt that these would doubtless escalate the conflict, bring other countries uh, into the war and perhaps generate um, the threat of a nuclear escalation. Very severe sanctions have been in imposed against Russia and the personal friends of Putin who are uh, in his immediate uh, circle. Um, and these sanctions have very severely limited but not totally cancelled the purchase of Russian oil and gas. On the bright side, <laughs> the bright side Ukraine and Russia uh, are continuing to meet and to have talks. Um, the last round of which, sorry, the, the penultimate round of which President Zelensky described as not bad. Um, and this morning, you may have heard, um, Zelensky has um, firmed up on something that previously he only hinted at, which is that Ukraine is ready to give up its uh, intention of entering NATO. Still, uh, if there is substantive progress towards stopping the hostilities, we don't know what it is. For the moment, uh, the shooting uh, continues. Now, here's what I think we know, and then what we plausibly suspect, but didn't before the war began. And I also have some remarks about things that we still don't know. First of all, about Russia. <coughs> We see that Russian conventional war capability is much less than we thought. The invasion is clearly poorly planned, poorly led, and suffers from very poor logistics. Uh, Russian morale appears to be low. Russian losses in people, and especially in military hardware, uh, tanks and planes, are high. We see that inside the Russian Federation, internal protest against the war does exist, but remains a marginal phenomenon. We see that support for Putin is very high at 71% approval, uh, and at least at the moment, societal readiness to tighten belts and withstand sanctions is also high. We see, and this is particularly disappointing, that the narrative that Ukraine is run by neo-Nazis and constitutes a security threat to Russia, and that the invasion for the purpose of denazification is justified, uh, is widely accepted uh, in, within the Russian population. Now this particular propaganda narrative, it appears, may have been believed by Putin and his planners themselves. Um, it appears that um, the consensus within the Russian leadership was that Ukraine would not seriously defend itself, that the Ukrainian government would fall, that Russian troops would be welcomed, <coughs> and that a puppet government would easily be installed. Uh, this, of course, has all proved to be false. On the basis of this, I think we can conjecture that blame shifting and scapegoating is now going on uh, in the Kremlin and particularly in the FSB, which is the follow-on organization from the KGB. What we don't know is how fully Putin controls uh, decision-making, uh, and we do not know what options for escalation, or for de-escalation for that matter, of the war are contemplated uh, in Russia. Now, about Ukraine. What we now know. We know that the Ukrainian military is 
remarkably and unexpectedly effective. We know that Ukrainian society has united in opposition to the invasion, that linguistic, religious, regional, and political divisions uh, have been relegated to unimportance, uh, and we witness scenes that nobody thought possible in the southern cities of Ukraine, which, under occupation by Russian Federation forces, see thousands of people gather for demonstrations proclaiming their loyalty to Ukraine. Uh, we've seen that Volodymyr Zelensky is uh, the leader for the moment, a unifying figure. He enjoys 91% popularity in Ukraine, which is slightly better than the 25% that he enjoyed. Uh, <coughs> before he put on his khaki t-shirt and, and blew his five o'clock shadow. <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> there is, um, well, of course, it's, it's, what one sees in social media appears to be a, a general determination from young and old to continue to fight. And the, the, the phrase that is repeated over and over again is because we have no alternative uh, because we don't want to live otherwise um, and there certainly is no lobby in Ukraine uh, in favor of surrender certainly uh, there is uh, on the contrary uh, a, a very strong sense that uh, continuation to fight inevitably will lead to victory and this is repeated not just by you know the, the, the armed forces of, of Ukraine TV channel but by ordinary people uh, who, who may be you know, uh, helping children sew camouflage nets or uh, in Western Ukraine prepare traditional Ukrainian comfort foods for you know, people in the well I see the other but yes they are Vareniki of course <laughs> Um, so there is a, an extraordinary uh, coming together of the nation and if we step back a little and, and generalize about this in terms that we academics um, recognize, uh, this seems to be a demonstration that in this instance the nation state, which many uh, particularly in academe have thought to be an outdated focus of self-identification can in the 21st century command loyalty and self-sacrifice and <clears throat> uh, it's very interesting to see what the objects uh, of this emotional attachment are uh, they are Ukraine as territory in the first instance as visualized on the map and this goes together with the sense that Crimea must not be excised from this map we the Donbass must not be excised from this map. And this territorial attachment, which ordinary people express when they say, this is my land, get out, what are you doing here? You have no right, I am sovereign here. This overlaps with the 19th century populist uh, idea of the attachment of the peasant to the land that the peasant works. Right? So, there's a historical dimension to this territorial kind of map-driven attachment. The second uh, <coughs> element of self-identification is the state itself. The state as that abstract entity uh, that allows the nation to determine its future. Uh, this is really the idea uh, of the nation state as the sole seat of democratic sovereignty. Right? Um, and again, on social media, you see time and time again people saying, we will not let any foreigners determine our future. Right? What is also interesting is that those old uh, identity markers of the nation, language, religion, and history, uh, take a second, they're way behind territory and state as objects of identification. So this is, this is civic nationalism, if you, if you want to use that, that word, uh, rather than ethnic or ethno-cultural 
nationalism. Well, <coughs> and if we consider now the international order and what, what observers of, of the international order, particularly those <coughs> not directly connected, particularly China, who is an absolutely crucial player and is at the moment deciding, I think, which, what to do under these circumstances, perhaps in the discussion, colleagues from Chinese studies might offer some opinions um, um, about what we might expect in that domain. What do we know? The West is not necessarily as disunited and as decadent and as unprincipled as Putin may have thought. Um, the United States is still capable of taking a leadership role uh, among Western countries. But at the same time, the, the West will not risk escalation that involves uh, the use, the possible use of nuclear weapons or the uh, involvement in the war of other countries. Um, the United States-China talks yesterday lasted for seven hours, and I'm sure that many interesting things were said there that we don't know about but can perhaps guess. What don't we know? Well, we don't know what chance the Ukrainian-Russian negotiations have of leading to a peace that is acceptable to the Ukrainians, and that means a, a peace that conserves the territory and the sovereignty of Ukraine, uh, and at the same time is acceptable to Putin. We don't know how the West will react to evident provocations from Russia, like the, you know, the bombing of the, that um, training base in the extreme west of Ukraine, where, where NATO did some of its training of, of Ukrainian troops, or the killing of a journalist of the New York Times. Um, these, these events are now 24 hours old, and there is no sign of a kind of an immediate, an immediate um, reaction to them. So perhaps, perhaps caution is being exercised here. Well, how did we get to this place, which two months ago was absolutely inconceivable, and I don't think anybody in this room predicted it, I certainly did not. Um, well, there are two answers. One is a kind of short time frame answer and the other is a, a, a long time frame answer. Uh, for the short time frame, we need to go back to 2013, 2014. This is the time of the Euromaidan revolution, um, um, which um, was stimulated by well, the refusal of the pro-Russian president Yanukovych to proceed with an association agreement between Ukraine and the European Union. But that was just a, a spark that set off the protest. The protest was really against the, the autocratic drift of the Yanukovych government and the criminalization of the economy as, it, as corruption just ballooned under, under his uh, reign from a, from a very high start base. So, <clears throat> in, the, in the confusion following that revolution, Russia took the opportunity to seize Crimea and to ferment a phony separatist movement in the east and to support it militarily. And the result <coughs> of that support in the east was a war whose most violent phase um, took place in 2014-15, you know, it was terminated uh, by the Minsk Accords. There were two sets of meetings in Minsk, uh, last of which was in 2015. And uh, the Minsk Accords seriously de-escalated but did not stop the shooting. The Minsk Accords, if they had been implemented, would actually have given Russia effective control, political control over the Donbass which, however, would have remained part of Ukraine and so would have been a constant source of destabilization um, of the country, um, would have um, been able to paralyze the country at 
times of Moscow's choosing. So <coughs> the, um, the terms were never implemented because the shooting never stopped entirely. Um, and so for eight years, of during which a ceasefire was supposed to be in place, um, and during which the parties were supposed to have withdrawn from the line of engagement, um, <clears throat> during those eight years, a low-grade, low-intensity war continued, but still it took daily, it, it, it had casualties, 14,000 people died, uh, have died uh, as a result of that war. Now, my conjecture is um, that Putin hoped that Western actors, particularly France and Germany, who were also part of the Normandy fo format which, uh, within which the Minsk terms were agreed, that Western actors would push Ukraine into accepting the Minsk Accords in full. And um, this didn't happen for a long time, so Putin upped the ante by surrounding the country with, with troops um, to focus the West's attention on, on the potential for, for such a thing to happen. And indeed, um, President Macron and Chancellor Scholz engaged in, 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 in more talks with, uh, uh, with Putin following the last, their last sort of talks with him before the invasion came to Kiev and at least one uh, well-placed Kiev source argues that what happened was that they endeavoured to persuade uh, Zelensky one last time to accept those terms. Zelensky refused. Uh, and so that having happened, Putin took the military option. And of the various, the, the great range of things that he could have done, he chose the most, the, the most extreme. You know? So um, it was supposed to be the blitzkrieg, you know, the, the quick, quick um, rocket attack, the um, uh, complete degradation of the Ukrainian armed forces, and then a swift march into, into Kiev and, and, and a rapid takeover. <clears throat> well, much of the commentariat thinks that um, Putin sees the main game as a kind of a no, 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 um, a zero sum game with NATO. You know, that, um, it's, it's actually a kind of a third party war with NATO. I don't believe so. I, I think that Ukraine is a thing in itself. You know, for for Putin, that it, it is an actual object of desire, and for the following reasons. For the, for the reasons are the long time frame explanation um, of why we are where we are. You see, Ukraine and Russia have very, very different grand historical narratives. The Ukrainian historical narrative. I'll begin with this one. I'll give it priority. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Ukrainian grand, grand narrative is that you know this huge medieval state of Kiev and Rus, which stretched from you know from the Baltic Sea almost to to the uh, to the Black Sea, with its capital in Kiev, was right from the start ethno-linguistically diverse and comprised many principalities. Um, it was a kind of a, a loose federation of states, and when the Golden Horde, the Mongols in the 13th century, invaded, um, <coughs> this state disintegrated, and Kiev and those territories that are now Ukraine and Belarus, they came within the orbit of a feudal polity called Lithuania tiny Lithuania, huge Belarusian and, and Ukrainian territories, which, however, was historical Lithuania. And subsequently, after Lithuania joined with Poland, the so-called Republic, the, the, the Commonwealth, called the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth in, in most historical texts now. Um, <clears throat> so Kiev 
and Ukraine while preserving the Byzantine tradition of Christianity, nevertheless developed within a general kind of Mediterranean, Atlantic uh, cultural context. At the same time, on the northeastern periphery of Kiev and uh, Rus, there, was, there were the principalities of Suzdal and Vladimir, and later on a city called Moscow arose there, and Moscow was led by a number of very competent leaders and knew how to get on with, with the Golden Horde. Moscow expanded, and the whole story of Moscow has been one of uh, expansion. It uh, renamed itself the Russian Empire in 1721, and then extended its territories westward, absorbing most of the Ukrainian lands, the remainder of the Ukrainian lands being uh, absorbed by Austria, because you know, why, would you, why would you not take what's on offer I mean, when it's available just for the taking? So <clears throat> then, in the 19th century, the Ukrainian national movement began as an absolutely typical Central European uh, quite Herderian in conception national movement um, with a culture beginning with a cultural revival that then evolved into the political demands for a nation state. So this is the absolutely well known Miroslav Hroch model of cultural nationalism translating itself later into political nationalism. Now this national uh, resurgence during the revolutions of 1917, 1917 resulted in a briefly independent Ukrainian state, the U Ukrainian People's Republic, uh, run essentially by leftist parties, socialist, socialist revolutionaries. Um, and then was absorbed into the USSR after a, a after being conquered by the Bolshevik armies, but so strong did Lenin and the Bolsheviks judge national sentiment to be that they established the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, including Ukraine as Soviet Ukraine as one of its first one of its first four members. And it is this republic within its existing Republican Soviet, Republican borders that proclaimed its independence in 1991 and established a nation state. And the, the Ukrainian vision of this nation state is that it embodies the historical state-building aspirations of the Ukrainian people. Now, the Russian narrative, uh, as you would expect, is different. So <clears throat> the Russian narrative says that with the fall of Kiev in, in 1240, the national and state traditions of Kiev and Rus were continued in the northeast uh, where Muscovy arose as an heir to Kiev. And the history of Muscovite and then Russian imperial expansion was actually the history of the restoration of an original wholeness uh, and, of course, greatness of the Russian nation and state. Now, Putin is a keen recipient and a great embellisher, it has to be said, of this narrative, um, to the point of denying that Ukraine and Belarus possess the status of, of real nations and yearning to renew a Russian world, uh, which is characterized, as it was in the 19th century, at the height of imperial power by the a triple slogan of orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality. And nationality, of course, meant Russian nationality to the exclusion of others. So <clears throat> this war is Putin's method of enforcing the unity of the, quote, Russian, unquote, people at any price. And um, my opinion is that this is his main game, and the, the NATO adventure is a kind of a, uh, a subsidiary concern um, which naturally plays into, into this scenario. So really the war might be called at the most general level a culture war because of the, its uh, historical roots in the mind of Vladimir Putin. 
it's a culture war in, in, in many other ways as well. So <clears throat> literature is playing a major role in Ukraine. It's, it's, literature has been writing about the war now for eight years. And uh, you may know this name, Serhi Jadan, the most, uh, the Kharkiv poet and novelist who stayed in Kharkiv just as Zelensky has stayed in, in Kyiv, is, has become a symbolic figure in Eastern Europe to the extent that his Polish colleagues have now nominated him for the Nobel Prize in Literature. Um, and I think he would be quite a respectable candidate uh, for that. Now, <clears throat> it should be said that during the eight years of the war, the, the, more, the se more serious, the more intellectual of the writers, not, not the populists, uh, have actually written about the war uh, either directly or you know, as, as a, margin, a marginal concern. And they have desperately tried to be even-handed in treating the sides of the war, uh, avoiding demonization or heroization of, of either side. Whether it will be a tenable position uh, in five years from now, who knows? Language. Now, there are many things about this war that will please the linguists in the room. Uh, first of all, is <clears throat> um, one needs to address this claim that, that Putin makes that the um, Ukrainian, that the Kiev government is engaged in a war against Russian speakers. This is, of course, an enormous furphy. In fact, everyone in Ukraine is bilingual. Although, of course, in the East and South, more people have Russian as their native language, and in the West and Center, more people have Ukrainian as their native language. Right? Um, the phenomenon of protests in Southern and Eastern Ukraine, with people wrapped in the, in the flag and, and having you know, inscriptions in, on, on blue and gold saying, you know, Melitopol is Ukraine, um, mostly they're chanting in Russian. They'll sing the national anthem in Ukrainian, but all of their communication is in Russian. Um, that famous meme, I, I, I think you probably all know this, the, <clears throat> the message sent to the, the Russian warship that challenged um, you know, 13, 13 border guards. Uh, Russian warship, go F yourself. <laughs> this, uh, this is, of course, articulated in Russian. So, and this is something that I'd like to hear the sociolinguists talk about. Obscenity has suddenly obtained a new legitimization in Ukrainian discourse. <laughs> um, Ukrainian used to be the domain of absolute moral purism. This has now <laughs> gone out of the window completely. Um, one, of the, one of the lighter moments of, of this has been the philological discussion that has gone on about how correctly to write the phrase go F yourself uh, according to the norms of standard literary Ukrainian. Now, the joke is, of course, that the phrase is in Russian. Uh, and then um, I've seen one post which you probably haven't seen. That's a, a soldier marching along a muddy road and you can't see him but he's talking and you hear what he's saying. And we hear him say in Russian, when this effing war is over, I'll never speak effing Russian again. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this reflects the possibility that an outcome of this war may be that Ukrainians, who hitherto have been very much at ease with the multilingual structure of their society, may become less so. I'm going over time. Um, and... Uh, I don't. I don't want to restrict to restrict the question and answer part. So I, I might just make one or two concluding remarks. Cultural orientation and affinity before 2014. You know, there are various ways of measuring the, uh, the the sense of friendliness or alienness that groups and nations feel towards each other. There are methods for doing this. And Ukrainians and Russians always 
had a very high level of mutual affinity. And this was reflected in things like the voting in Eurovision, where, where they exchanged votes, essentially. Um, this frayed, this, this really frayed over the eight years of the war. And now, after the initial shock, if social media is any guide, the identification of Russia, and not, uh, not just Putin, but Russia, uh, not just the Russian armed forces, but Russia as an idea, as an aggressor and an enemy, is practically universal. So this is what you do when you try to enforce friendship by the force of arms. And this shift towards outrage is reflected in orthography. Um, um, so people have begun and this has become universal just over days, writing the words Putin and Russia without capitalization. I'll stop there. I, I was going to talk about what the challenges are for a situation, of a situation like this for someone who for 30 years has professed the gentle ideal of a post-colonial uh, post uh, peace and mutual understanding as, as a kind of a, a, a realistic objective in, um, uh, in, in, in culture. But I, um, I'm beginning seriously to wonder whether that is an ideal that won't have to be put way into the distance, just as, just as the just peace, which must come at the end of a just war, is often put far, far into the ideal distance. Marco, on a, on a human level, there are certain things that, that, that we can do, we can, we can give and, and so forth. Um, focusing on, on a, a narrower sort of area of activism within academia, uh, uh, do you have any reflections on what arts and humanities faculties can learn from this? Or what scholars not working directly in Ukrainian studies can do? There's a big discussion about this within within Slavic studies and more generally uh, humanities circles, particularly in, in the United States. Um, and, uh, well, first of all, there are direct ways of helping scholars who happen to be you know, here with us and cannot go back. So any kind of extensions of their scholarships or grants that can be engineered until they're, a, they're in a position safely to return. We must, I think, avoid the, the temptation to engineer a brain drain from Ukraine and to keep people here whom, because we like them, rather than um, encouraging them to return when, when it's possible in order to rebuild their country. We can, there are such things as discretionary research funds. They are, of course, microscopic at, at this time. But the strategic um, placement of research applications, bearing in mind the possibility that a topic, well, first of all, this is a research topic par excellence. There is no discipline which should not be interested in what is happening right now, and I don't mean just the humanities, it's, it's everything, um, <coughs> involving, to, to make sure that there, there is adequate involvement and representation of people able to represent that experience and to research it in a, in a professional and a, as, pos, as far as possible objective way. There is the very important, though, absolutely costless uh, gesture that vice chancellors and representatives of, of important social and cultural institutions can make. Right? So it was very important that the GO8 made a strong statement uh, about the invasion calling a spade a spade. It was, I think, the, the, the vice chancellor, she didn't do it, at, our vice chancellor didn't do it at once, but she did ultimately write a, a strong condemnation uh, of what had happened. 
these things matter. My son in Stanford is now fighting a kind of private battle to, uh, with, with Ukrainians from Ukraine to persuade the Stanford administration to make a statement. They have so far refused to do so. Uh, MIT, on the contrary, has not only made a statement, it's severed all ties with um, uh, institutions funded by the Russian government. My colleagues at Melbourne University who are uh, uh, on editorial boards of historical journals uh, which have been peddling Russian propaganda have resigned their <coughs> positions uh, en masse. Um, 170 rectors at Russian universities have written to express their full support for Putin. So th there, are, there are many things, and some of them cost money, but some of them don't cost money. Uh, one thing that I think every, this is a kind of a general call to, to everyone, we have to have an educated society which thinks that international relations is everybody's damn business. That um, what happens in Ukraine must immediately have consequences in Australia. It, it's obvious there are already consequences in, in Australia. And elections should not look away from international relations as a kind of a too hard area. Foreign relations have to be part of the platforms of serious political parties and they should, it should be clear which side of you know, global geopolitical divides um, they want to take a particular country in. So, um, you know, as, as scholars of the humanities, we are in a good position to reflect on the French, the Italian, the Chinese, the Japanese response to these critical moments in the world's history. <laughs>